Yeah, we're about to get on that new new. Hey YouTube, welcome back to UniXDBS. And today we have a very, very special video because Bandai has made a major, major announcement in the TCG world. And we actually wanna jump directly into that and talk about so many things. We've actually had the opportunity to be contacted by the company in order to actually spread the word on this new endeavor. And that endeavor is Battle Spirits Saga. That's right. This classic game from 2008 is coming back with a brand new fresh spin and Bandai is pulling out all the stops to make this one of the most enjoyable TCG experiences that you've probably ever had. Now some of you guys may be a little confused by the statement classic with a new spin on it, but that is because Battle Spirits was a game made in 2008 by Bandai with the help of Mike Elliott, who, if you guys don't know, was a lead designer for games like Magic Gathering and Duel Masters, both beloved games in their own right. So this is going to be a really cool experience to see this game come back to life and actually just burst its way onto the TCG scene with a massive, massive starting prizing circuit. And we're going to get into that later in the video. But with that being said, I do want to be able to take this opportunity to get the word out there, talk about the mechanics, show off some of the art, and in the future even come up with things like demo deck, like expositions and whatnot, so you guys can really get the word about Battle Spirit Saga. So for most of you guys, this is going to be a brand new card game. But for the people that were actually following Battle Spirits during its original run, you're going to notice some differences in this game and its previous counterpart such as new card and frame designs, you're looking at the decks going from a 40 card size to a 50 card size, as well as the introduction of the mulligan system to better help this game fluidly transition into a more competitive base. And that's actually pretty cool. But we have so many details to dive into, but the first thing I'm gonna actually touch upon is the first trailer, because we're gonna showcase both of them in here. There was the announcement from earlier today and the announcement that actually happened back in August, and we're gonna start with the latter. So check this out. Pretty cool, right? Not only does it have this artwork that's just bursting off the page, but it actually has a really, really deep resource management system that we're gonna talk about a little later in the video. On top of that, this entire series is going to come with its own inbuilt lore that's gonna be explored through the cards and other media as well. It's actually a really cool springboard to launch a card game off of. But besides that, we wanna go back and we wanna look over the announcement that just came out today. And I do, really 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 implore you guys to go into the description click on the link for both of these and then just go leave a like comment on it give some traffic to the original videos but i'm going to put the announcement from today right here in the video as well the new competitive card game from bandai battle spirits saga with cash prize tournaments upon product release and a total prize pool of... One million dollars! More details coming soon. Don't miss out. Yeah, you heard that correctly. A one million dollar prize pool for the first year of competitive play. That is actually insane. And we're actually skating past the part that they are right off the rip doing cash prizing tournaments that's not you know store credit that's not product that is hard cash so this is going to be one of the most lucrative tournament circuits that any tcg has had and it's very very surprising because if you're a fan of bandai card games like myself this is the first time they've done that in their wheelhouse for at least quite some time and i've been playing their games for about five years or so so i mean it is what it is but this is crazy to be set up on and now, I bet you guys are all asking the same question. How do you play this game? Well, luckily, 
we are definitely going to jump right into that. But just because this is going to be an instructional video and I really hope that it stands the test of time and people come back to learn how to play Battle Spirits, I'm going to break this down into chapters. So just look in the description and you'll be able to see topic after topic and click to go exactly where it starts. So, hey, hope you guys enjoy. So the first thing I want to talk about is going to be the game area. Here, we actually are going to put up a sample map on the screen to show you all the zones where you put your cards as well as your cores. As you can see, we have a fair amount of zones to go over. The first of which will be your life zone. Here, you're going to start with five cores as your life, and whenever you take damage, you'll move them to your reserve. Next, you have the burst zone. You're going to be able to place cards here with burst effects, face down. And when you're ready to play another one, if you haven't used the one that's already face down, you will trash that one, and then you will place your next one face down. The following zone will be the reserve zone. Here is where your cores will accumulate. You can use them during your main step, and all the ways that you can use them will be discussed in the following section of the video. Next, the biggest zone will be your field zone. This is going to be where you summon your spirits and place your nexuses. The zone after that will be the deck zone. The deck zone will be where you have your main deck and where you will draw your cards from at the beginning of each turn or through card effects throughout the game. Following that, you have the trash zone, which is broken into two parts. Your discarded card pile, where you will place cards after they've been used, destroyed, or discarded, as well as your used core zone, where all your cores will go when you utilize them from the turn if they're not already on spirits or nexuses. And at the beginning of your next turn, you're going to be able to put them back into your reserve during the refresh step. As you can see, the game steps are also noted in order here, but that'll actually be the next segment of our video. So let's move on. So the first step, what you need to play. Both players are each gonna have one deck and those decks are gonna be comprised of three different types of cards, your spirit cards, your Nexus cards, as well as your Magic cards. You can have, at minimum, 50 cards in your deck, but it can be more, based on player preference, and you can use up to four copies of each card per deck. Now past that, we're gonna talk about cores. Cores come in two different kinds, your normal cores and your soul core, which we'll get into later. You'll need about 30 different marbles, dice, tokens, in order to signify your cores. And if you do run out of those, then you can always use anything else, but, for the sake of less confusion, I suggest you just carry around a whole bunch of tokens, dice, or marbles that are uniform so that you can keep track of your cores efficiently. Next, let's talk about getting ready to play. So, by following these steps, you'll be able to set up your game in order to start playing. Number one, pick a spot off to the side of your game map to place your cores before they can be added into the game. This is going to be called the void, okay? Two. As per usual, shuffle your opponent's deck, shuffle your deck, cut however you may feel like it, and then give each other your decks back so that you can have a completely randomized game state. Number three, you need to take five cores from the void and put them into your life zone of your play sheet. This is gonna be, of course, the life that you need to be able to take from your opponent to win or protect on your own end to survive. Number four, Take three cores and your soul core, and like I said, we'll touch upon that later, and you need to place those in your reserve area of your play sheet. So every game, you're going to be starting out with four core resources, and that's going to be how you cast your spirits, as well as your nexuses, as well as your magic cards. Number five, draw four cards of your deck. This is going to be your starting hand. Now six is going to be choosing who goes first. This is going to be done by random methods such as rock, paper, scissors, or probably more commonly, a die roll. Now, number seven, the final step of setting up the game is going to be starting with player one, you're gonna decide whether or not you wanna mulligan. This is one of the main changes from the previous game to this game. And if you do mulligan, you're gonna return your entire hand, it's not a partial, it's a full, to the deck at the bottom. You're gonna put the entire hand to the bottom and then you're going to draw four new cards from the top of your deck. Players who do not choose to mulligan will draw an additional card, making their starting hand five cards. So if your setup is great, great, you're going to be able to just get an extra card for that. Uh, that's really going to actually put 
some emphasis on deck building to make sure your ratios are all correct. The victory conditions for this game are pretty straightforward for Bandai card games in general. Um, the first player to achieve one of the following is going to win the game. A, your opponent's life is reduced to zero, or B, your opponent has no cards in their deck at the start of their start step. So, the important thing about this is that normally with Bandai games, the moment you draw a card and you can no longer draw anymore, you lose. If you draw a card and you have zero cards left in deck, you instantly lose. This is saying no cards left in their deck on their start step, which means that if you end a card, if you end a turn with zero cards in the like deck, if you win that turn, you win that turn. You don't lose until you try to draw your very next card and you have zero, which is very important. That means you can't go down to zero cards left in deck on a game push turn, which is a nice little change. So next we're going to talk about the game steps. Beginning with player one, you're gonna follow the following steps listed in order. One, the start step. Two, the core step. Three, the draw step. Four, the refresh step. These are the first parts of your turn, followed by the main step, number five, which is where all of your actions pretty much happen. Then, your attack step, which is of course combat. This is not like Dragon Ball or Digimon where you can fluidly go in and out of attacks. It appears that the attack step is going to be one big step where you have to declare all of your attacks or none of your attacks. Uh, and then you have seven, the end step, which is where the end of turn effects are all going to happen. So let's dive deeper into this. So as I stated earlier, step one through four is just the beginning of every turn. Your start step through your refresh step. Step one is your start step beginning the turn. Number two is your core step. You're going to take one core from your void and put it into your reserve. This is going to be how you passively gain a resource per turn. Now, an important note is that the first player is going to skip their core step on the very first turn of the game, meaning that you will start with four resources core-wise instead of five. This is to balance the act of being able to go first and being able to stick things on the board first. Next, number three, you have your draw step. Draw one card from your deck and add it to your hand. It is important to note that unlike the core step, this is not going to be skipped by player one, meaning that both players should have the same amount of card advantage unless one of you has caused a disparity by mulliganing. Last, you have the refresh step. In this step, you refresh any exhausted cards, and by exhausted, they mean cards turned horizontally, or as many people would say, tapped or rested and you turn them vertically, which is untapped or active. Then you move any cores in your trash that were used last turn into your reserve. So you're not losing your cores, you're just shuffling them from your reserve to the field, to the trash, and then back. Next, we're gonna talk about the main step, which is step five. In this step, you're gonna be able to place, use, or summon cards from your hand, move cores around, and set burst cards. In this step, you're going to be able to do basically most of the functions of this game. And so it's going to be the lengthiest section, but arguably the most important. So, you guys ready for this one? Because this is going to be the meat and potatoes. Here we go. Step five, the main step. Place, use, or summon cards from your hand. You may use the cores to pay the cost of cards in your hand in order to summon them onto the field or use them as magic. The way you pay a card's cost is the same for all cards in the game. There is no limit to the number of spirits or nexuses you can have on the field at any given point. Next, you can set burst cards. Once per turn, you may set a card with a burst effect by taking a card from your hand that has a burst effect and placing it face down in the burst area. If there's already a card set, you will be able to discard that card to the trash to place a new one. And uh, yeah, when the burst conditions are met, you can use the burst card and activate its effect without paying its cost. So, these are game changers, these are tide turners. And having the correct ones in your deck and placing them in the correct stages of the game will surely help you move yourself towards victory. Next, you can also move cores. You may freely take cores that are on cards on your field or in your reserve and rearrange them as you'd like on your spirits and nexuses. Alrighty then. So now we're gonna talk about how to pay a card's cost, which is arguably one of the most interesting parts of this game structure so far to me. Step one, you're gonna check the cost at the upper left corner of the card. Uh, there's always gonna be a number there, but next to that number, there's going to be a number of reduction symbols. 
Uh, so the example on this graphic is going to be three on the first one, two on the second one. Now, this is the kicker, the cool part for me. Looking at your permanents, your spirits and your nexuses that stay on the field, they're going to have in the corner reduction symbols of their own. It is by these many symbols that you have in your field that you're going to be able to reduce cost by. So in this diagram, you actually have three permanents on the board and each one of them have one reduction symbol, which means that while all three of these are on the symbol, you're gonna be able to take off three reduction from any card you cast. So if a card has three reduction symbols next to a four cost, if you had that board set up, a total of three reduction symbols on your field, you are going to be able to reduce this four cost by the three reduction that's also on the card, making it only cost one core to play, which is amazing. Now that being said, this is going to have its own stipulations. If a card only has two reduction symbols, but it costs four, and you have a total of three of these symbols on your board, because the card itself only has two reduction symbols, you can only take off two from its cost, making it a two cost. You see what I'm saying? But we'll get more into that a little later. So after you figure out the net cost of a card, which is the cost of the card minus its reduction based on the amount of symbols you have on board to fulfill those requirements, you are going to move the net cost from your reserve to your trash. So once again, to come back to the example, if you have three spirits on the board and they each have one symbol that's going to give you a total of three reduction so if you have a four cost spirit or nexus that costs four of course but it has three symbols of reduction on it you're going to be able to make that a one cost card so you're going to move one core from your reserve to the trash to play it because it has been reduced to its net cost of one now after you finish summoning a card you may then take cores from the reserve or the field and place them onto the new card. You must place at least as many cores as indicated by the card's lowest level, which is a mechanic that we're going to get in very soon. And then the, um, the card is successfully summoned. At any point, if a card does not have its minimum level of cores on it, it is destroyed and placed in your trash. And this is, of course, going to further go into the more complicated, in-depth parts of this game's mechanics, and frankly, the resource management that excites me the most. Now, for magic cards, you activate the card's effect, and then after the effect is resolved, you place the card into your trash. It's not a permanent like a nexus or a spirit. So, number six, the attack step. First, we're going to talk about attacking and battling. Uh, on your turn, you may attack with a refresh spirit or untapped spirit or an active spirit, however you decide to designate it, and uh, yeah, that is on your field by exhausting it. Your opponent may then block with a refresh spirit of their own. You may continue to attack as many times as you have refreshed spirits. So this is going to be a game that doesn't seem like it has summoning sickness, but you will need to have things in refresh position in order to swing with them. Now there's two different kind of lines we can go through here. If your spirit is not blocked, reduce your opponent's life by the amount of uh, the attacking spirit symbols. So the same things we'd be looking at for the reduction cost also serve as its amount of damage dealt when it goes through. Then you place those lost lives into your opponent's reserve. So damaging your opponent will give them an extra resource to cast with next turn as part of the balance for losing life. Now. This does leave room for things in the future having two different symbols, three different symbols, which will be huge to reduction costs as well as damage, but we'll have to see where the game goes. Next, the other line is if your spirit is blocked. If your spirit is blocked, you can pair the battle power or the BP. The spirit with the lower BP is destroyed. If the spirits have equal BP, both spirits are destroyed. So this is gonna be something that's a little different. Um, in some of Bandai's games, if you defend with a creature, you know, battle card, Digimon. If there's a tie, nothing really happens. Uh, if something's higher, nothing really happens. But in this game, it's gonna be a little different. You're gonna need to worry about your opponent blocking with something that's stronger than your attacker because you will lose your attacker. Adding more stakes and a different level of strategy to the attack and defense step. Now, if something is destroyed, whether it's attacking or defending, you will place all the cores from a destroyed spirit back into the reserve. 
which is very much so cool because if it went to the trash you wouldn't be able to use it that turn but at least if it goes to the reserve you're going to be able to use that core or those cores immediately so i think that's a really cool flow of resource next we're going to talk about refresh and exhausted cards of course once again refresh cards will be the ones that are vertical exhausted will be the ones that are horizontal untapped tapped pretty simple basics that most people that play bandai card games already know but even if you don't play bandai card games you could really be playing magic and you know that is tapped and untapped or vice versa you be playing Yu Gi Oh, and you can kind of see that as attack and defense even though that's not quite the same that's the furthest off but this is kind of how that goes next there are flash windows flash is just as you'd assume if you played magic these are cards that are played in response or you know just between steps these are cards not played in your main phase they can kind of be tricks because they can happen unexpectedly and in this game there are two flash windows one is before attacking before and after sorry declaring a block so yes they both happen in the attack step and one of them is before you declare a block one of them is after so you can use the cards with the flash icon during these windows and that's actually pretty cool you can attack and use a flash before somebody can declare a block or you can watch them choose a block and use flash you can also do this as the defending player too the defending player though always gets the first choice to use a flash or pass priority to the attacker then it goes to the defender again and so on switching back and forth and you resolve the flash effects immediately it's not like a chain link or anything if you're used to Yu-Gi-Oh, you resolve these effects the moment you play them now a flash window ends when both players pass in a row and for people that don't kind of understand what i'm putting down here that's saying if i attack you and you're the defender you now have an opportunity when i declare the attack to use a flash if you choose not to it then goes to me and if i choose not to we are officially out of the flash window and you can declare a blocker as the defending player now that you've defended as the defended player choosing a blocker you now have the option to use a flash maybe you use it here in response i now can use a flash maybe i have a flash that i want to use in response to you using your flash then after you use yours and I use mine, it then goes back to you. If you say, nope, no more flash effects, and I go, nope, no more flash effects, we are now ending the flash window. That may be a little harder to show until we have gameplay, but I promise you guys, I will be willing to show you that. But if it's a little hard to understand, please rewind it, check it out, and uh, you can always ask in the comments, and I will explain it the best way I can because that's what this video is for. Finally, after this, you have the end step. All temporary effects activated during this turn will come to an end, so any lingering effects, you know, and uh, then it passes on to your opponent's turn. Pretty simple, step seven is. But now, we can move over to the card types. Give a little more clarity about what we're doing here. So in this next section, we're gonna talk about the different card types, and we're gonna dive into the mechanics that are gonna be most relevant for them to help you understand how to play the game better. The first type of card we're going to touch upon is the most prevalent card in your deck, Spirits. So let's go into our first one. So, card that's first up is Imperial Thunder Dragon Seagworm. Uh, the couple things I want to point out first and foremost, it's a Star Dragon slash Ancient Dragon. May not really have too much of an effect now, but I think this is going to come into play heavy when we start looking at more tribal effects or cards that revolve more around star dragons or ancient dragons or whatever these typings tend to be per card. Next, I wanted to point out that it is a six cost with three reduction symbols. And so as we were talking about before, that changes its net cost depending on what you already have invested on the field. If you have a combination of three reduction symbols, between your spirits and your nexus cards this guy can go for as low as three three cores just three cores to play this absolute behemoth and then the second part i want to talk about when it comes to casting this is that other effect that when you play a spirit you then can move cores from your resource or your field onto the card and this comes into play with these levels you can see that it has level one four thousand battle power one Level 2, 6,000 battle power, 3. And level 3, 9,000 battle power, and 5. When you cast this card, you are going to be able to move a minimum of one core to it, making it a 4K battle power card. Or you can end up moving up to 5 to make it 9K. This is going to be where that other level of resource management goes. 
of course you can only have a minimum where you at minimum you have to have one on there and if you ever decide to shift around cores and you take off its cores so it has zero it's going to go to your trash but you can see that its effects are based on its level level one two and three get confront which says while this spirit attacks your opponent must block if able this is a form of removal already because your opponent has to put a body in front of it now only if you are at level three though does it gain during your attack step all of your spirits with awaken gain confront and that is crazy that means that everything with the awaken keyword is going to be forced you're just going to force your opponent to block it and that's actually a huge momentum swing but we'll talk about that more in depth in a later video however what i do want to focus on is how the way this game's resource mechanic works with the cores and the way you cast spirits there is a whole nother resource layer added on for instance to cast this without any reduction at all no permanence on your board via spirits or nexuses this is going to cost a flat six from your reserve you're going to take six cores from your reserve put them into your trash play this guy but on top of that somewhere from your reserve or on your field you're going to need to take one core and play it on this guy so all together this essentially takes seven cores to play I'm, I'm gonna say raw however if you have those three reduction cards or reduction symbols on your field this guy is going to actually cost three but then you need to see how much you want to invest so either way to get its maximum power you're gonna have to spend a maximum of essentially eight cores from your reserve and or your field and what i mean by this is if you have the correct reduction symbols on field this is going to cost three from your reserve take those to the trash play this boss card and then you're gonna have to take five cores either from your reserve or other cards while hopefully making sure that you don't take them down past their minimum which would trash them and you're gonna put them on this guy and in that point he's going to be a full-blown 9k battle power giving everything with awaken confront during your attack step with confront on his own so as you can see choosing which level that you pump your guys up to is going to be a major strategic part of your resource management and i am already in love with that sort of effect so after that the next type of card i like to talk about would be the nexus type and the example that we have here is scorched battlefield it is a four cost with two reduction, meaning that at most you pay four for it, at least you pay two for it. And we'll leave it at that for now because we went to quite the lengthy explanation of it earlier. But this card does not have a minimum amount of cores you need to play on it to be at level one. And it has a level two as well that you would need to put two additional cores on it. Now, looking at these effects, level one and two, during your attack step, all of your red spirits gain one battle or 1k battle power, which is really, really cool. That's just slight math, but it's simple. It's to the point, more pressure. Now, it's level two. Draw a card when you reduce your opponent's life. This is actually really cool. You keep this on board, and that's subtle card draw. You're only going to be able to use that card draw mm, four times in a game because you give yourself five life. So, um, yeah, you'll be able to do that four times in a game before the last life is just you taking your opponent's life for game. But that's still a little bit of incremental advantage. And this is pretty cool. Now, this isn't really much else to talk about when it comes to this type of card because, for the most part, that was covered with the spirits. But as you can see, you got the cost, the reduction, and different levels with different effects attached to those levels. And that's the most important part. So, let's move on to our next type of card. So here, we're gonna show off the magic card, and as an extra bonus, it's also got a burst effect, so we'll be able to see both of those. The card in question is Landmine. It's a three cost with only one reduction, so you're gonna be paying at most three, at least two. Uh, then, it has two effects, so we're gonna talk about its main and flash, and then we're gonna go into its burst. But its main and flash, select one spirit, it gains 2k battle power for the turn, um, during this turn, and that's, that's pretty cool too. Because this is main and flash, uh, you're going to be able to use this when you're attacking or when your opponent attacks and you block. So this is a battle trick. You'll be able to change the math of the battle after your opponent decides to block with it or when your opponent decides to swing and you declare a block. Very, very cool. Now, 
This is also a burst card, meaning that you can place this face down in your burst zone and wait for its conditions to be met. Its conditions are when, our, when an opponent destroys your spirit, and when that happens, you can select one of your opponent's spirits with 3,000 or fewer battle power and destroy it. Then you may pay this card's cost to activate its flash effect. So depending on what's going on, you can really get some double value out of this. Blowing up a weenie that your opponent had, now that that opponent has one less attacker, but also beefing up one of the like spirits that you planned to block with. I think mean, that's pretty good. So, this is how magic works. And now we're going to move over to two examples of, I'd say, more advanced uses of these based off of the cards that have been put in this demo deck. So moving on to some of the finer mechanics that we are able to see here. Uh, earlier, we talked about setting up the game and putting three cores from your void into your reserve along with a soul core. We're going to talk about that mechanic, and the card that's going to show us this mechanic is Blade Dino Parasaur. So you look at this guy, he costs four, he has a two reduction, and a reduction of two, and he has levels one, two, and three, but only levels one and two actually have, like, effects, you know, actual tiers. So he always is going to have confront, no matter whether he's level one or two, and that means he has to be blocked. But if you make him level two, so paying two for him and then putting a total of three cores onto him, when he attacks, you can pay using your soul core to draw a card. Now, this mechanic is important because your soul core is only one core out of your entire deck, or I guess collection of cores. Because of this, you can only use an effect that has a soul core as a activation cost once per turn, at least for now. Now, every turn, since your cores are going to go from the trash back to your reserves, you're going to be able to refresh this soul core. But in this particular case, this is a once per turn additional draw as long as you use your soul core for it. Now clearly, because this is such a finite resource, there are going to probably be a lot of cool power plays that involve your soul core in order to, you know, activate. But this is just one of those cases where you're able to see how it can randomly factor in to a specific card. And I think that's really cool to super juice an effect, you know, kind of like a kicker. But there's also one more card I want to show that actually just kind of has another kicker effect. The next sort of kicker effect is going to be on a magic card. This one is called Volcanic Break. It's a five cost that actually has a two reduction symbol effect. So you're going to be able to play it for three at minimum. And it's main and flash. So the effect is you select one of your opponent's spirits with 3000 or fewer battle power and you destroy it. Really good snap removal. However, if you spend a soul core as part of this card's cost, as part of its three or five, depending on how many reductions you have on board, you select a spirit with 6,000 or fewer battle power instead, making a much stronger removal. So this is kind of cool because using your soul core, you can just jumpstart effects into a new stratosphere of power. And I think that's actually a really, really cool effect. But with that being said, that is all of the cards that uh, we have to go into in terms of types and different mechanics. So let's go into the rest of the video and kind of close this one out cleanly. So, what do you think? Are you hyped? Because frankly, I am. Some more news about the release. The game will be releasing with four colors, those colors being red, purple, yellow, and white, with more colors on the way in development, along with, like I said before, a lore that's going to build a world around these cards. So there's going to be a story to tell along with the TCG that we hopefully learn to love to play. I'm very, very excited for this release, and I'm going to be hawking any content that comes out, I don't know, like a hawk. That sounds corny, but hey, it is what it is. I am really, really digging this. I hope you are too. I hope this video really helped you understand the basics of the game. And like I said, in the future, we're going to be having more content with it. And hopefully you're going to get some stuff like some demo decks on screen. So yeah, definitely stay tuned. At the same time, I'd like you all to turn your attention to two different things. You can follow just at BSS underscore TCG on all social media. You'll be able to find that on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. Just give it time. It's already up on some of these platforms and I'll leave the links to those in the description as well. Past that, you can also go to the website, which I have up on the screen right now, just to be able to see what kind of assets you can find, like get hype about the game, read more about the game. And like I said, it is only going to explode further from here. 
The game mechanics are all in this video laid out. You know they're having an explosive beginning of the tournament season for this game. And all there really is to do is just wait for more information and get ready for this monumental release. So I wanna thank you guys for just showing up, watching the video, looking at the different parts. If you wanna see the rest of the cards, from this demo deck. I will be posting them on my own Twitter, at UniverseXGaming, um, at UniXDBS. I'll have the link to my Twitter in the description. You'll be able to see those. I'll be releasing those shortly after this video goes live. Um, I'll also be putting some of the product descriptions online as well, so you guys can see all those things. And also, like I said, make sure you go and give a follow, most importantly, to the Twitter that's officially associated with this card game. But if you like to leave me one too, wouldn't mind. Do all sorts of fun gaming stuff there. So thank you guys. I hope you liked the video. Uh, subscribe for more Battle Spirits content as well as other games such as Dragon Ball Super and uh, One Piece. And yeah, I will see you in the next video. Later.